So thank you all for joining us today. We are grateful for the opportunity to share how Latinos are impacted by conservation issues, why it is important we are engaged on these issues, and what we are doing to address, to address some of the challenges our community faces. Um, so a few housekeeping items. All participants are on mute. Um, the chat function is not anonymous and mes messages can be public or to the panelists themselves. There is also a Q&A function if you look at the bottom of your screen um, that you can direct questions to panelists and once questions are answered, they will appear and be part of the recorded webinar. So a little bit about Hispanic Access Foundation. Our mission is to connect Latinos with partners and opportunities uh, to improve lives and create a more equitable society. Our vision is that one day every Hispanic individual in America will enjoy good physical health, a healthy natural environment, quality education, economic success, and civic engagement in their communities with the sum of improving the future of America. A little bit more about Hispanic Access Foundation, we have some key uh, initiatives, one of them being Latino Conservation Week, uh, which is an initiative of Hispanic Access Foundation and was created to support the Latino community getting into the outdoors and participating in activities to protect our natural resources. The core purpose of the MANO project, which is short for My Access to Network Opportunities, is to connect, build, and develop thoughtful Latino leaders who share a passion for serving and strengthening their communities. We build trusting relationships with organizations and federal agencies to provide professional development and training opportunities for Latino college students and graduates. Por la Creación Faith-Based Alliance's mission is to develop stewards of God's creation by educating and engaging this generation to leave a legacy for the future. This group seeks to educate Hispanics and to encourage active engagement in supporting the nation's public lands and protecting our natural resources. A little bit about myself. My name is Chela Garcia. I'm Director of Conserv Conservation Programs with Hispanic Access, and I'm honored to be moderating this panel. A brief overview of what we'll be covering today. Uh, I'll do some brief introductions of our guest speakers. Uh, I'll do a brief overview of the conservation toolkit that we put together and, and are releasing today after this webinar, which is a guide to land, water, and climate issues and the impact on Latino communities. Then we'll open it up to our guest speakers, our wonderful guest speakers. And lastly, we'll have um, a short Q&A, and at the very end, there'll be a link to Hispanic Access Foundation's Conservation Toolkit. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Cruz, who's a former intern at El Mal País National Monument through Hispanic Access Foundation's Latino Heritage Internship Program. Danny Miguel also went to, through the Latino Heritage Internship Program and is a former intern at Everglades National Park. Dr. Juanita Mora is a national spokesperson for the American Lung Association and the CEO and a physician with the Chicago Allergy Center. Virginia Ruiz is Director of Occupational and Environmental Health at Farmworker Justice. Alessandra Najera is Program Officer at the Water Foundation. And lastly, Benalis is Nick Goulet, Executive Director of the Watershed Center. And uh, shortly we'll be hearing from them individually. So a brief overview of why we're having this webinar and why it's so important to engage Latinos in conservation issues. Um, the Latino population exceeds 18% in the US currently and is projected to double by, 20, um, by 2050. Latinos represent the largest untapped segment of the population that has a passion for the outdoors and stewardship, provides growth potential for the recreation and tourism economies, and has the willingness to protect our nation's natural resources for future generations, which we actually embrace as a moral obligation as well. When you take this perspective and couple it with the growing electoral power of the Latino community, you find a political force that not only has the potential to shift the balance on conservation issues, but really a mounting desire to do so. In fact, many polls show Latinos carry strong concerns for the environment, which is deeply rooted in our culture and history of taking care of the land for future generations. Latinos have been vocal advocates for creating new national monuments, protecting water sources like the Colorado River, and encouraging the permanent reauthorization full dedicated funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and establishing and maintaining regulations under the Clean Air Act. Latino voters consistently poll higher than other voters on issues concerning protecting public lands, ensuring water availability and quality, and addressing climate change. 
So, you know, why do Latinos care? <clears throat> These issues impact our access to services and the health of our families and our communities. Our stories and contributions to this country lack representation in the narrative and history of our nation. And our communities are a significant component of natural resource workers. And as the Latino population grows, will play an even greater role in the success of our economies, renewable energy industry, and in the labor workforce. So a quick overview of this toolkit, which you'll have access to at the end of this webinar. Um, we cover two main points. One is public lands, um, understanding how Land and Water Conservation Fund and the Antiquities Act are important to Latino communities. Um, and then climate change and how greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, um, extreme heat and drought and wildfires all impact the health of our communities, um, our jobs and, and the future of our, of our population. So a quick overview um, of public lands. Latinos are 30% less likely to engage in physical activity than their white counterparts. Only a third of Latinos live within walking distance of parks compared to almost half of white individuals. And Latinos are 21% more likely to live in urban heat islands because of lack of op uh, access to open spaces. If you look at our national parks and our national monuments, only about 4% are dedicated to the Latino community. And if you ask Latinos, 94% of Latinos in the West see public lands as an essential part of the economies in their states. The Land and Water Conservation Fund um, is a fund created from royalties of offshore oil and gas development. Um, and so it's at no cost to taxpayers, provides funding for states and municipalities for park maintenance and creation of parks in underserved communities and rural communities. Um, and has helped protect uh, more than 2.2 million acres of national parks and supported 42, 000, over 42,000 uh, parks and recreation projects. Uh, some of these iconic sites supported by LWCF are El Camino Real de Tierra Adentro National Historic Trail, Apodaca Park in New Mexico, Aslan Park in Denver, Colorado, and Jose Marti Riverfront Park in Florida. But this is just a small number of the projects and, and parks that have been supported by this. And what's really important is not only 85% of Latinos support the reauthorization of LWCF, which thankfully was permanently reauthorized um, just recently, uh, but we need to understand that funding is a, is a really big component of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and that's actually um, still a battle we're challenging, we're, we're facing. Um, just recently, the, the President's fiscal year 2020 budget zeroed out funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and so just putting it on your radar that not only is this important for Latinos, it's important for all Americans um, because it supports local and state parks that traditionally don't have the funding to support uh, green and open spaces. So the Antiquities Act um, was signed into law in 1906 and um, with 17 presidents, nine of whom were Republican and, ten, and eight of whom were Democrats, created over 130 national monuments. Um, 33 of all presidential designations through this act are dedicated to inclusive and diverse histories compared to only about 22% of congressional monument designations. So this is an important tool for Latinos to have the opportunity to have their history shared. Um, in our public lands. And 75% of Latinos would support the creation of new parks and monuments in their state. To name a few of these um, who have been, that have been designated, designated by the Antiquities Act, um, the Cesar Chavez, e. Chavez National Monument, El Morro, Browns Canyon here in Colorado, uh, Santa Snow in California, and Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks in New Mexico. So um, climate change is, also a very important um, issue that is uh, disproportionately impacting Latinos. About 100, uh, Latinos are about 165% more likely to live in counties with unhealthy levels of particulate matter pollution. And more than 1.81 million Latinos live within a half mile of existing oil and gas facilities. Latino children are 60% more at risk than their white counterparts of having asthma attacks exacerbated by air pollution. And 19.5% of Latino population of the Latino population is not covered by health insurance compared to only 6.3% of whites. And this is important because it shows that um, not only are we, are we disproportionately being impacted by our proximity to these facilities um, and to this air pollution, but we don't have the resources necessary to deal with them, uh, to proactively um, deal with our health in relation to how this air pollution is impacting our families and our communities. 
87% of Latinos would prefer to work in the clean energy economy than a, rather than a fossil fuel company or at an oil refinery. Um, and 60% would vote for a candidate based on their position on global warming. And this is super important, seeing that the, our electoral power is only increasing in the United States. 81% uh, support requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax, and 81% would like to continue tax incentives for solar and wind energy production. This is important because we do have a, an opinion and our voice does matter on these issues. Extreme heat and drought, um, 2015, 2016, and 2017 were the warmest years in NOAA's 138 year climate record. And this is important because Latinos, I've already said this, Latinos are 21% more likely to live in urban heat islands than their white counterparts. So we're more impacted by increasing temperatures. 16.8% of Latinos are natural resource workers, meaning we work outside in these increasing and hotter temperatures compared to only 10.3% of whites. There are about 2.5 to 3 million farm workers in the United States, 80% of whom are Latinos. And construction and farm workers, um, you know, 58% of occupational heat deaths are directly related to construction and farm workers. And so if you look at the 80% of Latinos who are farm workers and the 16.8% of Latinos who are natural resource workers, increasing temperatures are disproportionately gonna impact um, our health, um, are gonna increase our exposure to heat illness and heat heat deaths. The Colorado River um, is actually having lower flows due to higher temperatures um, and increasing demand. And I will um, go uh, expand upon this, you know, 1 tr uh, the Colorado River supports $1.4 trillion economy, including agriculture, recreation, power generation, over 16 million jobs, and sustains over 40 million people, including one third of the nation's Latinos. Um, and lastly, wildfires. Um, Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans experience a 50% greater vulnerability to wildfire threats compared to other census tracts. Some of these barriers faced by Latino and immigrant communities include a lack of inclusion in disaster planning, linguistic barriers and disaster preparedness and response, a lack of easily accessible translated emergency res um, alerts, lack of readily available and translated preparedness materials, a failure to inform immigrants of their rights to, to disaster aid, a very unclear process for responding to a loss of documents, discrimination and racial profiling leading to exclusion of individuals from shelter and aid, and inquiries about immigration status, and a lack of coordination between different government agencies and tiers in disaster response. So thank you for, for giving me time to kind of quickly run through the toolkit. Again, all of that information will be available um, in a link at the end of this uh, webinar. But now I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie Cruz, who is our former intern at Edmai País National Monument and a former intern with um, our Latino Heritage Internship Program. Stephanie? Hi there. Hi. Um, so I'm Stephanie um, and I did um, a project with El Mal País National Monument. And well, essentially my project was um, preserving the history and finding out the history of like the park. Um, the park itself, so the National Monument Mal País has a lot of history. Um, a lot of it is connected with um, Spain settlers and people and the Native American tribes. And a lot of that history has been like intertwined. And one of the things that I learned, you know, in my internship was that a lot of the families that are descended from that, from the settlers and then from the people who are like the Native American tribes who's been there, um, they have a lot of that history there. One, and I think it's like really important and I think it's really amazing that I was able to go in there and find out that history and also write it up and preserve it um, because my position was ethnohistorian. Um, so a lot, I learned a lot of that history and I, and it also helped me realize that the Antiquities Act helped preserve and directly impact me as a Latina and as a Hispanic. Um, it helped me impact me because it helped me learn more about where I'm coming from. It also helped a lot on that, to let me see that a lot of that is being, actually being preserved and it's being helped through a lot of, um, like the laws itself. Um, 
the Antiquities Act helped make helped made that um, the North Place National Monument into like a monument, and a lot of it has directly impacted. I feel a lot of the residents there who live in that small town and into the into the, both of El Moro and El Mar País National Monument. I think it's amazing that they've been able to preserve it and they've been continuing to do this internship specifically to continue recording that history that wasn't I probably wasn't been able to do if the act itself wasn't implemented and then had this park made into a monument and into both of these monuments. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, one of the things that I remember is that the park has is very engaged with the community. Um, one of the things that I was able to participate in was that they provided hike trails and they provided trails to, you know, go see the the bats that they have there over there in the bat caves. Um, and that's something that I was able to participate in, in that a lot of, they try to engage a lot with the Latino community and help them come in and come out and kind of help them be like healthcare. So go on those hike trails, help them like learn more about kind of um, the, the, the stars, that that's one thing that I was able to attend to, um, that um, the visitor center in El Mal País will have a night where you can come in and they'll let you come in and they'll let you see the stars and they'll like educate you on all the things about them. So that I feel like that's really important because not only are they educating Latinos, they're also engaging them on those things. Um, I feel like it's so far been a well-rounded kind of experience. And I think that Antiquities Act has helped impact me as a Latina and helped impact a lot of Latinos in that community so far. I've seen that they've tried to engage. One of the events that I did was they brought in a lot of um, uh, kids come in so they could see and hear more about the kind of jobs available to them. Um, through the national park and like the monument itself and they were able to learn more and kind of know more about the history of the park through that themselves. So I'm not sure if any of you guys have any questions. <laughs> yes, thank you for that, Stephanie. We'll, we will take questions at the very end. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so next we do have um, Danny Miguel, who's also a former intern at Everglades National Park and um, an intern with the Latino Heritage Internship Program. Oh. Danny, I'm sorry, you're, you're on mute still. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for having me uh, as a part of this important discussion today. Um, so, I am a former LHIP intern um, here at Everglades National Park, and I will talk about that at the very end because I want to give some context and background first. So one of my first, um, my earliest life memory, actually, not one of, but my first is actually of being here in the park, and it was of me looking over a boardwalk and seeing an alligator underneath me. And I really can't remember anything about my life before that. I think that might have been just a very striking moment for me, just seeing this huge animal in front of me. Um, but it's it's through LHIP, I was able to come full circle and and kind of go on this next journey in my life through Everglades because parks have been a part of my life since the very beginning. So one of the parts that was essential to my upbringing was Tropical Park here in Miami, Florida. And that was actually made possible. That park was made possible because the LWCF provided the funds to acquire that land and to develop that land. Right? And I would go to that park every afternoon. This is something that I didn't remember as a kid, but I was talking to my parents as I was doing research about the LWCF. And they told me, yeah, we would go there every single afternoon. Um, and so I got to go out with my siblings and my parents and we, and those are the memories that I, besides obviously being in the park, um, and Everglades National Park, um, and seeing that huge alligator, spending those afternoons with my brother and my sister and my parents, we played soccer, we ran, we, we hiked, uh, we biked. Those are the memories that I still continue to cherish now as an adult. And I hope that one day I can pass, you know, I could do something like that for my children. Um, 
but we need access to public spaces, right? And we need programs like the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Another pivotal part, and really important part to me was Tamiami Park also in Miami. I was a swimmer my entire life and Tamiami Park was the only Olympic sized pool within a 25 mile radius from me. And so at that pool, we had a club that I swam for, which was one of the best swim teams in the state of Florida. Okay, we, every year we competed in national uh, championships, junior national championships, and um, Olympic trials. So this was a huge community resource to us because uh, on our team, you know, we had mostly Latinos. Miami is a largely Latino community, and we were almost all Latinos, and we went the distance. You know, we competed around the country, not just locally. Um, and through that park, you know, not just do these athletic opportunities arise, but employment as well. There are tons of staff that work at that pool. There's a tennis center there. There is a soccer field there. And all of those different recreational opportunities drive economic opportunities. And so my first job after I finished swimming wasn't as a coach, but a lot of my friends did return to that pool. And that was their first job as an assistant coach. And that allows for up upward mobility, which brings me to my LHIP internship. So before my LHIP internship, I'm a non-traditional student. I am just finishing my AA. I'm 25 years old, but I left school for quite some time to kind of figure out where I was going. And along the way, it was kind of hard to get back to school because as you get older, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know, your responsibilities uh, become a lot greater. And so through LHIP, I was actually able to finally find a job and a sort of community within this park um, that could allow for me to save up enough money to go back to school. And afterwards, that next year, I went back to school and I'm still here two years later in the park um, in a different capacity and as a different intern with a different organization. But because of that exposure that LHIP gave me, I am now gonna graduate this spring. I have had that opportunity to finish my degree and that is made possible because there was a park here and there was a, there was a community here that welcomed me. So, so I think my story is not, um, not it's too unique to our community. I feel like there are a lot of stories all across the country like this. All we need really is an opportunity for upward mobility and access to public spaces. And that is what the Land and Water Conservation Fund represents. So um, I'd be happy to take questions later on. Thank you so much, Danny. Absolutely. So next we have Dr. Juanita Mora. Um, she's the national spokesperson for the American Lung Association and CEO and physician uh, with Chicago Allergy Center. Dr. Mora. Thank you for having me today. My name is Dr. Juanita Mora and I am happy to join this important conversation as volunteer national spokesperson for the American Lung Association. I'm a first-generation Mexican-American, and my grandfathers worked the lands as braceros when they first arrived in the United States. Today, I get to represent people like them, and it is an honor to be a voice for those that have no voice. Um, today, I'm actually going to specifically talk about how climate change degrades air quality, which harms health, especially the health of Latinos. Climate change increases the risk of unhealthy levels of air pollution, including ozone and particle pollution as well. Ground level ozone pollution is more likely to form in warmer temperatures, which is why you often see warnings about dangerous orange or red air quality on hot days. The, the nation has made great progress in actually cleaning up ozone over the past few decades, but we must do more to protect millions of Americans to run from unhealthy ozone levels and climate change is making it more difficult. Ground level ozone is an invisible gas that irritates our lungs, much like a sunburn irritates our skin. And the damage it can trigger is our asthma attacks, respiratory and cardiovascular harm, and even cause early death. Rising temperatures from climate change intensify drought, resulting in more dust and wildfires, another way that climate change degrades air quality. Both dust and wildfire smoke fill the air with particle pollution. Wind can carry dust and smoke particles for hundreds of miles. Like ozone pollution, 
Particle pollution can trigger asthma attacks, cause respiratory and cardiovascular issues, and even cause early death. It can also trigger lung cancer. Climate change affects air quality in other ways too. As temperatures rise, plants produce more pollen, which means more ragweed and other allergens. Warmer temperatures also allow allergens to flourish in new regions and for allergy seasons to last longer. While air pollution like ozone and particular matter are a health concern for everyone, some populations are at higher risk, including children whose lungs are still developing, older adults who are especially vulnerable, and people who have lung disease, heart disease, and diabetes. Furthermore, many Latinos face a greater risk from the health harms of air pollution. This is because of a number of factors. Communities of color may be more likely to live in counties with higher levels of pollution. Hispanics were more likely to live in counties that had worse problems with particle pollution, researchers found in a 2011 analysis. More than 1.81 million Latinos, as Chela pointed out, live within one half mile of existing oil and gas facilities. As a result, many Latino communities face an elevated risk of cancer and respiratory health risks due to air toxic emissions from oil and gas development. Some Latino populations have higher rates of certain health conditions that may put them at greater risk. For example, diabetics are among the groups most at risk from air pollutants, and Mexican Americans and people living near a central city have a higher incidence of, of diabetes. Additionally, Puerto Ricans are disproportionately have an increased morbidity and mortality from asthma compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Latino children are 60% more at risk than their counterparts of having asthma attacks exacerbated by air pollution. As climate change worsens air quality, Latinos will be disproportionately impacted. Those who experience other disadvantages such as low socioeconomic status may also be more susceptible to health effects. Lack of access to health care lack of access to grocery stores and good jobs, as well as dirtier workplaces, um, traffic exposure, are among the factors that could handicap these populations and increase the risk of harm. The poverty among Latinos in 2016 was 19.4% compared to the national poverty rate of 12.7%. This means that one in five Latinos will not have the economic resources to prepare, adapt, or cope with health issues, disasters, increasing temperatures, job insecurity, and other consequences of climate change. It is critical to fully implement the Clean Air Act and support actions on climate change to make sure that all Americans, including all Latino Americans, have healthy air to breathe. Note that this year's State of the Air report will be available and will be the 20th anniversary report, and it will come out on April 24, 2019. It will be posted at stateoftheair.org. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your knowledge and insight, Dr. Mora. That was wonderful. Next, um, our next panelist is Virginia Ruiz, who is the Director of, uh, Director of Occupational and Environmental Health at Farmworker Justice. Virginia? Hi, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to present this information today. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about um, the impact of rising temperatures and excessive heat exposure to the health of of workers across the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so heat is the leading weather-related killer. And as temperatures rise, heat-related workplace injuries and illnesses will also increase. Um, 18 of the last 19 years were the hottest on record, and climate change is predicted to intensify. Every year, thousands of workers become sick from exposure to heat, and some even die. Um, in the 24 year period before uh, between 1992 and 2016, nearly 70,000 US workers were seriously injured 
um, and 783 workers died from heat exposure. These numbers are actually um, thought to be uh, undercounts um, since most workers don't report illness um, and the injury and fatality data generally underestimate the devastating effects of extreme heat exposure in workers. The impacts of uh, excessive heat range from relatively minor problems such as heat cramps to more serious effects such as organ damage, heat exhaustion, stroke, and even death if it's not treated properly and quickly. Heat exposure also aggravates existing health problems like asthma, kidney failure, and heart disease. Workers in agriculture and construction suffer from the highest incidence of heat illness, but the problem really affects all workers exposed to heat, including indoor workers without climate controlled environments, for example, um, uh, workers who uh, work in, in warehouses or factories. Uh, next slide, please. While workers in many occupations are at risk for heat illness, um, farm workers face special challenges because of the unique features of, of who they are and where they work. Um, so I wanted to give you just a brief demographic snapshot of, of who um, farm workers are. Um, as uh, Chella mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, there are approximately two and a half to three million workers, farm workers, hired farm workers in the United States, and most of them are, are Latino. Um, they are the, among the poorest of the working poor, uh, with estimates that um, of, of uh, about 25 percent of workers earning under the poverty level. And so, um, because of this, workers um, can't really afford to stop working to treat or recover from injuries. Um, they're afraid of losing their jobs if they take time off um, or if they report injuries. Um, most are, are foreign born, 70 to 80 percent. Um, some, uh, a, a, a large majority of them, um, estimates are between 50 and 75 percent of farm workers are undocumented and, and um, lack um, legal work authorization. So, um, in addition to being afraid of, of losing their job, there's the heightened um, fear of, of, of deportation uh, if they raise concerns about heat stress or uh, require the most basic protections from it. Um, and because uh, they're foreign born, they're immigrants, um, um, language um, barriers are, are also an issue. Um, Spanish is the dominant language of most workers, but there are significant portions of the workforce that speak um, uh, Haitian Creole, um, uh, indigenous languages from Mexico and Guatemala, um, also um, Caribbean uh, English speakers from Jamaica, for example. Um, so these language barriers result in um, a lack of awareness of, of their rights as, as workers. Um, also, you know, where they work puts them at heightened risk. Um, obviously, the work involves hard physical labor during the hottest months of the year. Um, at times requiring heavy or, or hot um, protective clothing. Um, many workers earn piece weight wages, meaning they're paid by the amount of produce they pick and not by the hour. Um, most farm work is performed in direct sunlight and um, often there's not sufficient quantities of drinking water um, readily available or workers um, might not take a break to um, to drink it because it would take time away from from work, especially if you're in peace weight, peace rate uh, wages, um, and they're also reluctant to to take a, a work break. Um, just wanted to mention also um, living conditions also uh, exacerbate um, heat related illnesses. Um, many workers, especially if uh, they're in housing provided by an employer, um, won't have air conditioning. And so um, their bodies don't have an opportunity to cool down and, and recuperate at night or um, during off hours. So despite these high rates of injury and, and, and high risk, there are surprisingly very few laws in place that directly address prevention of heat-related injuries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, heat related illnesses are largely preventable um, if simple precautions are followed, namely access to water, rest, and shade, and the opportunity for workers to gradually adjust to working in hot climates. Um, 
most employers don't provide these measures voluntarily uh, in only three states, California, Washington, and Minnesota, um, and the U.S. military have um, issued any sort of, of regulations um, around heat-related uh, illness. Uh, in 2012, Farmer for Justice and a public citizen petitioned OSHA to issue a, a heat, um, uh, heat stress prevention standard. Um, that petition was denied. Uh, but OSHA did uh, embark on an education campaign um, to alert workers to the dangers of, of heat-related illness. This is um, part of an educational brochure that, that um, you can find on, on OSHA's website um, targeted to farm workers about um, you know, how to prevent heat stress. Um, next slide. Uh, so, I just want to close my remarks by mentioning some proactive activity that is currently taking place around the problem of heat-related illnesses. Um, there is a national campaign uh, spearheaded by Public Citizen, United Farm Workers Foundation, and Farm Worker Justice. Uh, we're joined by a diverse national network of more than 130 public health, labor, and environmental organizations. Um, the campaign was launched last July to win worker protections from heat stress through national, state, and local advocacy. At that time, we petitioned OSHA again to establish protections for both indoor and outdoor workers who are subject to extreme heat. And through this campaign, we're working to um, both raise awareness around climate change's impacts on the health and safety of workers and also to push through some much needed reforms. Uh, the petition calls for OSHA to issue um, a heat-related prevention standard with some common sense solutions to prevent heat-related illness. For example, requiring employers to provide workers with access to water, rest, and shade during periods of high temperatures, a plan to help workers acclimatize to working in high heat, um, information and training on prevention and recognition of early symptoms, and um, importantly, strong whistleblower protections so that workers won't be afraid of reporting dangerous working conditions or um, reporting any injuries that they have as a result. Um, OSHA, even though we uh, submitted that petition last July, uh, OSHA, surprisingly, not surprisingly, still has not responded to our petition. Um, and because of this, uh, Representative Judy Chu of California has stepped up as a champion on the issue. Uh, later this year, uh, she will be proposing legislation that would require OSHA to um, issue a, a, a heat, protect, uh, heat illness prevention standard um, to prevent uh, heat-related illnesses and death. Um, if you want to know more about this campaign, uh, you can visit um, uh, the website of Public Citizen um, at citizen.org slash heatstress, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vitimia. That was amazing. Um, and very much, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, Vitimia's information will also be available, um, so she can point you to, to the right resources. Next, we do have Alessandra Najera, who is the program officer at the Water Foundation. Alessandra? Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Next slide, please. A quick word about the Water Foundation. We are a threefold organization. We provide grants to nonprofits working on a variety of water issues. We convene organizations to work on difficult water policy challenges and we shape campaigns to secure land work quality, water policies as well. Um, these goals are all structured around securing safe, clean water for people, restoring fresh water ecosystems, and building climate resilience. So my conversation here today will focus primarily on the first and third goals. Next slide, please. So, next slide. Oh, back one. Oh, it looks like we have one missing there. That's okay. Um, just wanted to say uh, a quick comment. Uh, Aguas Vida is a common statement in uh, my Mexican family, and I think it resonates for, for them and for our communities because water is at the heart of so much of who we are and what we do. And this is kind of a, uh, a common thread across cultures, but it's particularly true for Latinos in America where water carries key cultural significance. 
where Latinos experience disproportionately the failures of our water systems in times of drought and climate change. And Latinos have historically been left out of drought policy and planning in the USA. So this slide um, presents the, the distribution of population of Latinos in the United States. As you can tell, um, there's a concentration in the West, which is where historically the United States has experienced severe fluctuations in precipitation with aridity and drought being the dominant condition, but also flooding um, kind of periodically depending on, on climate change. Um, so recently, also according to Pew Research Center, Latino populations are growing in the South where climate change is increasing the prevalence of drought and other water-related climate emergencies. Uh, so water scarcity didn't limit the development of the American West um, because of the efforts of um, incredible engineering and governmental efforts, um, which allowed heavily Latino cities like Los Angeles and Phoenix built in the middle of the desert where they're now experiencing um, drought issues over the last decade um, that we only expect to get worse. In the Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the, the cumulative effort that we have gone through to engineer systems who provide reliable water for most Americans have been successful, but have left certain communities out of the conversation. So we faced repeated crises of not enough water, too much water with flooding, and polluted water. So our lack of comprehensive drought planning in particular exacerbates existing system inequalities. Um, these tend to hit communities struggling to get by and communities of color the hardest. One of the challenges we've had, particularly in California's severe drought, where the Water Foundation focuses a lot of its work, have been with wells running dry. So uh, communities, particularly in the Central Valley of California, which is primarily agricultural, primarily um, focused around agricultural economies with a huge um, proportion of farm workers and other industrial workers is a, a great example of drought impacts on Latino communities. Um, for example, East Porterville, it's a community of a few thousand people, primarily farm workers. It's an unincorporated area, so there aren't a lot of local resources to devote to challenges. Um, was relying on shallow domestic wells. And due to increased groundwater pumping during California's drought, uh, their wells actually started running dry. And so drinking water, bathing, and everything. This community to a local system that did have safe water, but it took a huge amount of media attention because of the drought and uh, a huge amount of community organization and connection to the capital. So when we leave these communities out from our organizational planning, there can be huge health consequences and huge economic impacts as well because these communities end up paying up to 10% of their budget just to have safe drinking water. Next slide, please. Water quality and contamination is another huge issue in California and across the West. And drought and climate change have uh, the impact of growing these challenges. Um, extensive scientific research has been done on groundwater basins and the impact of drought. When you are lowering your groundwater basin, you are concentrating contaminants in that water that people are reliant on for their drinking water. So this photo is in Munson, California, where communities are also reliant on shallow groundwater wells that are contaminated with nitrates, naturally occurring arsenic, and other dangerous contaminants. So um, this is uh, Maria Jimenez. She has lived in Munson for 10 years and has not had clean water during that entire time that she's li been living there. In 2011, a UN official uh, toured the Central Valley and called it comparable to conditions in third world countries and expressed particular concerns about racial disparities of the impacts of these contaminants. So in California, we've passed a law to make safe and healthy affordable water human right, but um, we are still working to make that right a reality for our residents. And this is also an issue in other states across the West. Next slide, please. So those were the challenges, but there also is immense opportunity. Um, due to polling done from the Water Foundation, we found that um, huge percentages of Californians support create the creation of a fee to ensure that communities, even if they're not their own communities, have 
safe drinking water. And poll after poll identifies clean water for all as a top priority for both Americans and for Californians. So we have an opportunity where people understand um, the consequences of toxic water and a lack of water, and we need to figure out how to capitalize on that. Next slide, please. Um, as the polling that Hispanic Access Foundation has done indicated, um, the Water Foundation polling has also highlighted that voters of color perceive a wide range of significant threats to clean water than do white voters. Uh, and some of the top priorities include global warming, climate change, and long-term drought. Uh, this poll was conducted by FM3, a, a nonpartisan polling firm that polled voters across the United States. So water means more than something to drink in the Latino culture, according to professors at the University of New Mexico that we work with. Um, water is a boundary. It is um, full of historical meaning and connection to community and health. And these are all connections that we need to use in our movement to secure safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water for all. Next slide, please. So solutions. The Water Foundation has identified a number of different uh, strategies that we are taking, and we'd like to invite all of those participating in the webinar to join with us. The first is we have a number of policy mechanisms that we're working on, but for this webinar, I wanted to focus on a few of the systems interventions that we have prioritized and, and talk about how you can get involved. Next slide, please. So our first uh, goal is to broaden who makes water decisions and how. And as you can see here, um, this is from a rally for safe drinking water hosted by some of our grantees and including uh, Icon Dolores Huerta and uh, advocating for safe and affordable drinking water in California. Um, we are working to ensure that water governance reflects the full range of communities it serves. So working to elect um, people of color and women to local water boards to be able to change governance in their communities. Um, rather than having a top-down structure um, so that people are empowered to promote inclusion, participation, and uh, partner with governments rather than waiting for governmental solution to come their way. Next slide, please. And we are also working to strengthen the stories we tell about water. Part of um, the weakness in some of the water communications that we have evaluated and worked with is you know, a lack of including all voices of impacted communities. Water can be a little bit technocratic. It can be dominated by people who want to talk about the science and the jargon, but we need to talk about the people who are actually impacted by these choices that we've been making. So this is uh, Carolina Garcia, who lives with her husband and five children in an unincorporated community in Fresno County in California. She has recently learned that her well is contaminated by unsafe levels of nitrate. So she is forced to buy drinking water or buy bottled water for drinking and cooking, um, but they still have to supplement that with contaminated water from their wells. So um, this story was shared in a series called Toxic Taps and Water Deeply, which I um, highly recommend you look at. So next slide, please. If you would like more information on our California Safe and Affordable Drinking Water campaign, you can see safewater4ca.org. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, much Alessandra. Um, next, we do have Nick Goulet, Executive Director of the Watershed Center. Nick? Hear me okay? Hello, thanks. Appreciate the opportunity to be here to participate in this conversation. Uh, my name again is Nick Goulet. I run a not-for-profit organization up in far northern California. Uh, we do local community fire adaptation work there uh, with all the partners in our community. Uh, but we've also grown our work out to, to partnerships that are statewide in California and then in partnership with the Nature Conservancy with funding from the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Interior. We run a national program called the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network that has us working with community leaders from all around the country uh, who are struggling with learning to live with wildfire and helping communities adapt and become more resilient to wildfire. The map in the lower right of the slide provides a snapshot of many of the communities that we work with. Uh, you can see a pretty even distribution. However, I'll note, you know, that the that the space, the domain of wildfire adaptation, like so many 
of the public spaces uh, in, in our country is very Anglo dominated. And uh, however, the conception of community resilience requires thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And many of the people I work with around the country are, are sort of looking for those partnerships and ways in to um, empower Latino community members and, and bring them in into the work. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is looking to the left of this slide, the conception of fire adaptation um, involving interventions before, during, and after fires. Uh, Chela and, and Dr. Mora and Ms. Ruiz all provided some really excellent examples of how communities of color and Latino communities in particular are disproportionately affected by wildfire. Uh, there are issues of labor, there are issues of uh, equitable access to health, care and education, and there are issues of clean water, and, and so I'll talk about some of those and some of the policy dimensions that uh, I think would be of interest. Uh, before the fire there, and, and during the fire, there's a substantial portion of the workforce uh, that participates in uh, forest thinning and brush and fuels reduction. Uh, in tree planting in and in wildfire suppression that uh, are are Latino and uh, you may have heard the term pineros it's sort of a, an, an analog to the farm worker um, population that Ms. Ruiz was talking about and uh, like in farm work uh, so much of this work is uh, low paying a great deal of it involves uh, immigrants or non-residents uh, so there are real issues around uh, how the H-2B uh, program is deployed, how federal procurement and service contracting gets deployed, and whether it's equitable and accessible, and then about Service Contract Act enforcement. And so that's about working conditions. Uh, again, these workers are being exposed to heat stress, and they're being exposed to uh, working in remote locations, and, and there are a lot of abuses that occur in that sector uh, that, of course, are trying to drive profit for, for a smaller um, portion of the people who are the owners of those businesses that capture the federal work. And so um, both in fire preparedness and in fire suppression, uh, there are real opportunities for Latino communities and workers to have access to economic opportunity. Um, but on the other side of the coin, there's rife kind of abuse and, and lack of lack of sort of justice in, in how that opportunity is deployed and accessible. Also, before the fire, uh, there's preparedness and prevention. So there's education programs and there's mitigation and hazard reduction programs that are deployed uh, by states and by the federal government um, and by states using federal money. Uh, that are often disproportionately distributed. And so state and cooperative fire assistance, those are programs of the federal agencies, disaster preparedness um, that FEMA helps to deploy through their pre-disaster mitigation assistance program. Uh, these, are, these are programs that, again, are disproportionately distributed. And so there's an opportunity uh, as we identify and stand up and, and increase participation of, of Latino communities and organizations, there's an opportunity for more just distribution, uh, better design of programs that are accessible to Latino communities and, and a broader sort of and more diverse partnership in our sort of collective efforts at the state and federal level and, and in communities. During the wildfire, uh, this is when we have evacuation and we have sort of disaster management uh, and where we have that really acute impact of particulate matter uh, that can affect communities that aren't even directly being affected by the flames. And the Central Valley of California is a per perfect example of where uh, wildfire smoke can really impact um, substantial populations, uh, uh, Latino populations. And so... Uh, what are we doing to actually uh, mitigate those impacts? Uh, there's a real need for an investment in 
public health workers that are in Latino communities and are represented by Latinos. Um, there's a need for more clean air refuges that are appropriately placed and spaced to be accessible to Latino populations. And all of that requires participation and representation uh, with federal agencies, with state agencies, with local air quality districts uh, around the country. And, and then finally, there's, there's after the fire. And so that is thinking about access to FEMA resources that Chela uh, referenced at the beginning of, of, of the webinar. There's mental health and trauma counseling um, after a disaster. Uh, individuals, families often experience PTSD from either loss of home, loss of landscape, um, or the traumatic effects of living under a pall of smoke and, and, and pollution that, that can really exacerbate health impacts for, for those populations that are most at risk. And so thinking about language barriers, thinking about that participation in disaster planning that then helps to drive outcomes in the wake of disasters, and then the public health dimension. So how, do we, how are we providing access to trauma counseling and, and, and mental health counseling uh, that becomes a long-term need uh, after these, these events, these traumatic events? And so I think before, during, and after wildfire, there are roles to play uh, that are proactive, that are opportunities to see Latino communities, populations, organizations more engaged and more um, in the driver's seat of, of designing programs and deploying programs that are accessible to their communities. Uh, I will end there. Thank you so much for that, Nick. And I know we're rounding out the hour. It just turned uh, 12 o'clock Mountain Time, 2 o'clock Eastern. So I did want to open it up for um, questions now from uh, the audience. Um, if you'd like, you can ask a question with the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, unless somebody is typing, they don't see any questions. Um, so that everybody <clears throat> has access to the toolkit where a lot of the information that I presented at the beginning um, of the presentation is available at this um, link, just so that you know, and, and to be transparent, the information, we did participate in some of the polling through the Colorado College poll, uh, State of the Rockies, um, and similarly with some polling in California that we've done in the past, but a lot of uh, the information, most of the information in the toolkit provided at this link um, is just a compilation of um, the wonderful and amazing work of, of our, some of our partners here um, and of other research being done around the impacts of public lands, water, and climate issues on Latino communities. So you can see that compilation at this link. Um, if I, don't, I still don't see any questions, so I will end the webinar now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, um, all of the, the speakers, for your time and your wisdom. Oh, wait. I do see. Okay. Okay, sorry, I thought I saw another chat. Um, well, with that, thank you, much, thank you so much, panelists and um, participants for your time. And um, if you would like, I will chat my email and the rest of the panelists can also chat their email if, they, if you would like to get in touch with them. Otherwise, um, if you reach out to me, you are more than welcome um, to ask me for their contact information and I can provide that as well. Um, we look forward